Okay, I would like to welcome everybody to the CAPE June event 2023. I'm Mark Ledbeater, I'm the Development Manager for CAPE, and we're looking forward to a bumper crop of eight presentations from ACON funded projects, including um, our CAPE ACON Postgraduate Awards for postgraduates, as it says on the tin, um, our CAPE Blue Sky Awards. Um, we don't actually have a present, yes, we do. We have one presentation from the Blue Sky Awards, and that is for um, postdoctoral researchers. That's a longer project. They have nine months to do that. Um, we don't have any reports from CALPA projects, which is the Cape Acorn Undergraduate Project Award for fourth year undergraduates. And for the first time, we have presentations from the Cape Acorn Postgraduate Student. Yes, Student Award, which is CAPSA, which is for um, MRES students for their um, mini project presentations. So our first talk this morning is from Juan and Nicolescu on blue phase liquid crystal phase modulators for astronomical adaptive optics. But before she can give her talk, we need to present her with her certificate. So congratulations. And not only that, you get a cape bag and pen. So lots much. of goodies. Great, brilliant. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Juana Nicolescu, uh, and today I'll be talking about blue phase liquid crystal phase modulators for astronomical adaptive optics as part of the ACORN project that I've been doing for the past few months under my supervisor, Professor Tim Wilkins. Now, there's a lot of words here, I understand. Uh, I hope I will be able to explain them all by the end of the presentation. So I'll start by talking a little bit about adaptive optics, what it is, especially within the scope of astronomy and why we're looking to use it. Um, as part of this, we're going to be using some wavefront correctors. So I'll talk about them at large with the more common ones that are used for astronomy. And then I'll go into blue phase liquid crystals and why particularly I wanted to use these uh, in order to solve the problem that I've been seeing, uh, along with some results and some ideas for future work. Now, adaptive optics is a technique. It's a system that we use when we have dynamic phase distortion. Uh, what this means is we have some phase distortion introduced by a medium which changes over time. Uh, now, this is being used in many fields, uh, particularly astronomy, it came uh, through as part of astronomy, but it's also used in ophthalmology in order to image the retina and microscopy with uh, live cells that change over time. And uh, I've put an asterisk uh, here in communications, Earth to satellite communications specifically, which are quite a lot like what we would do for astronomy. So the point of one of these systems, as you might see here, if I can minimize this for a moment, um, as you can see here, we'd have uh, an image of Neptune with and without adaptive optics. So you can see why exactly this provides such a benefit. So what it would do is it would re reduce the wavefront aberration present in the system. Now, how does it appear in astronomy? It appears due to the atmosphere. Um, we've got uh, the atmosphere that has a temperature and some wind speed that pushes air around. And this is what leads to that blurriness that uh, effect that means we can't really resolve the details in the picture. Now, it's quantified uh, in a few ways, uh, mainly through uh, this coherence length, uh, which is some displacement. If we were to look at two stars, as we see here, at a certain altitude, we can define some length over which the distortion introduced by the atmosphere is below a certain threshold. So that means uh, over that area defined by that coherence length, uh, we don't necessarily need to apply adaptive optics. But obviously, this is not uh, present on a large scale, so we need it for larger telescope apertures. Now, from this and with the wind speed that we know, we can figure out, well, over which time would this change, and at what angle from the ground would we see this, this length that doesn't require adaptive optics. So knowing these parameters, um, some systems have been developed in order to reduce this uh, distortion. So what we have here is a 
typical layout of one of these systems. And we've got a, uh, here I, I took an image of Neptune, uh, say we have a distorted wavefront, so it looks blurry. We would have some form of corrector that is in the first instance not being activated. Then we would split the beam onto a sensor and onto an imaging camera. And initially the imaging camera would see this. Now, when our sensor measures um, initially by looking at a star, how good of a, of a point source that is, we can apply some form of correction to get that point smaller. When we've reached that uh, small point, then that uh, correction that we've applied, we're gonna apply to all of the objects that are near that star. So here we would have, with some correction applied, Neptune being imaged properly onto the camera. Uh, as part of my PhD, I've uh, completed this this side of the system. I don't have an imaging camera because I'm not actually looking at space uh, right now. This is all on a test bench in the lab. But um, the one thing that I don't have is a high speed corrector. This is necessary because the atmosphere changes very rapidly on the order of one millisecond. So typically uh, in astronomy, correction is done by deformable mirrors. These are great. They're, they're, they're fast, they're polarization insensitive, they're wavelength insensitive, uh, they're very precise. The reason why they're wavelength insensitive is because they apply this correction through a variation in the distance traveled by the wave. As you can see here, an incoming wavefront that is distorted to some extent uh, would hit this uh, deformable mirror and as it's reflected, it would then become perfectly flat again. Um, the one trouble with this is that they're very costly and they have moving parts. So on the back of such a deformable mirror, we would have actuators, either pistons or magnets that would bend its shape. And um, as we move on to larger and larger telescopes, such as the very large telescope, extremely large telescope that are being built, uh, we need more and more actuators on the back of one of these mirrors. So my thinking is, this is where liquid crystals could come in. Um, they function a little bit differently. They apply this phase correction through a variation in the refractive index meaning uh, we've got this wavefront, uh, it would move through, in this case, uh, a transmissive uh, spatial light modulator from liquid crystal, meaning it doesn't get reflected, it just passes through. And the light that travels through these sections with refractive index N1 would move a little bit slower than the light that travels through here, meaning by the end, this uh, transmitted wavefront will be flat. Now, these are lower cost. They're generally lower power consumption, uh, they're compact, which is great. They have no moving parts. But historically, the reason they're not being used in astronomy is because they are very slow. They're polarization sensitive and wavelength dependent. Um, we could come up with a series of requirements uh, for liquid crystals and why, um, what we need them to do in order to be uh, appropriate for an uh, astronomy setup, which is that we need to have a wide wavelength band, polarization sensitivity, accurate phase modulation, a moderate number of actuators, high optical throughput, and fast switch switching time. Now, liquid crystals can do most of these, um, except for wide wavelength band, polarization and sensitivity, typically, and the fast switching time. Now, with this project, I've tried specifically to uh, achieve a fast switching time with polarization and sensitivity. So this is where the blue phase would come in. Now, um, with liquid crystals, we've got them uh, in uh, various phases, anywhere between um, more crystalline, more solid, like uh, all the way up to isotropic, which would be more liquid. Um, the blue phase is a phase of liquid crystal that is just below isotropic, so just below that of liquid. Um, what happens here is over a very small temperature range below when they would be liquid, these molecules tend to orient themselves in, in these uh, structures and form this wood stack. Now, the fact that they're only stable over a one degree temperature range, obviously does not initially make them uh, very useful in a more commercial application, but they can be polymer stabilized, which means uh, we can mix these molecules with a polymer and with a photo initiator. We uh, get them to this temperature that they form the blue phase, and then we expose them to UV in order to stabilize that phase. Now, these are very useful because they can achieve this fast modulation and they are inherently polarization independent because of the way that these molecules are oriented in any sort of direction. Now, 
Um, I've mostly, uh, as a basis for this project, I was looking at some previous work that was done in our group, um, which was, uh, we have these devices, but they only have two pixels. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we need devices with many, many pixels for astronomy, somewhere uh, in the range of thousands of pixels. But obviously, as we know from display technology, liquid crystals can typically achieve this. Now, the only difference would be we have to achieve it with blue phase and with larger cells. Now, um, this has been, this was quite a successful device uh, in our group. So as a basis for this, I was looking at the same uh, polymer stabilized blue phase mixture and I had some results, I had some <laughs> results. I uh, managed to achieve some blue phase growth. Um, uh, these are only, they only exhibit that structure that I showed you over quite small areas uh, because these are mainly defects. The, this orientation of the molecules does not necessarily happen naturally. Um, it happens as a defect and then it grows. So uh, we've got these platelets, as they're called, these, these grainy structures. Um, they Here they started growing at around 50 degrees. Um, and I have a video here that if I can show you of the blue phase actually growing and growing as the temperature of the cell goes lower and lower. Now, um, these are platelets that grew under uh, a certain cooling rate, uh, quite a large cooling rate, half a degree per minute. But then as I moved to um, lower cooling rates, I started seeing these larger structures being formed. Um, so with these larger structures being formed, uh, it's, it's quite consistent with uh, what is known in literature, which is that um, having a very slow growth leads to more and more uniform platelets. Um, but the problem that I was seeing with my work is that these, this growth was halted. So instead of being um, continuing to grow over that one degree temperature range, it would stop. Now, um, I have some reasons as to why this might be the case, but uh, it obviously would need a little bit more work. Uh, mainly is that the construction of the cell could be made slightly different. Um, I'm suspecting the the layer of liquid crystal is not quite as um, flat as I'd like, and that um, there is a problem with the uh, construction of the cell leading to some leakage of the liquid crystal out of the cell, meaning I would need to make sure that these are uh, more robust to being heated up and cooled down over and over again. Now, um, to conclude the, this side of my project, I've planned to find um, a solution for adaptive optics for astronomy uh, by using liquid crystal correctors as opposed to the form of mirrors. Um, blue phase shows really promising uh, properties in general to be the first uh, liquid crystal structure to be able to be tested in an adaptive optic system. Um, I've grown it in transmissive test cells, but I have not managed to stabilize it due to that halted growth that I showed you. Uh, and the idea would be that in the uh, time left for the project, I would need to make a pixelated backplane to then have these cells be tested in the system that I showed you I built before. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Do, you, we, do we have any questions? What material did you use? What temperature? What cooling rate with numbers? So um, I created a mixture that was uh, an E7 liquid crystal mixture uh, with uh, polymer and photo initiator. Um, these were, uh, as you can see in this picture, these were some of the first uh, tests that I did but uh, it was in a lincum stage. So I would heat up the cell up to about 55 degrees and then slowly cool it down half a degree per minute until I started seeing the blue phase and then slow down the cooling. Um, this would happen around 50 degrees. 
So from 50 degrees down, I would uh, cool it down at 0 0.01 degrees per minute. Um, but it would soon slip away from me and the growth would stop until I would get down to about 49 degrees and then uh, the structure would start to disappear. So I, I still have to figure out what that is. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Anybody online? Oh, we have one more chat. chat. Okay, well, the different growth structures in side 11 and 12, what do we expect the difference of phase modulation performance in these devices? That's from Zhao Guo. Go on. Right, so by growing it slower and having those larger structures, uh, they would, in essence, be more uniform across the area of a pixel. So um, I don't necessarily expect the, the dynamic range, if you will, of the devices to be that much different. What I expect is uh, the phase modulation applied by one pixel to be uniform across the entire area of the pixel with the uh, larger structures. So that's kind of why I'm intending to, to move very slowly in temperature, if you will, um, to, to grow those very slow, uh, large structures. Okay, well, thank you very much. If we've got no further questions. Can we thank our speaker again? <laughs>So good morning. My name is Wojo and uh, I'm a yesterday PhD student in CVDS group. This Kappa project is collaborated by me and uh, Xiaomeng, another PhD student in our group. And uh, we are supervised by Professor Dabin Chu. The topic today is the efficient fabrication of uh, PBDOE for holographic structure light projection. Uh, so diffractive optical element nowadays is a key component for structural light projection that can redistribute collimated beam into uh, user-specified patterns. It has wide application in computer vision and artificial intelligence. Um, here are some uh, examples of light projection through DOE. And uh, there are two main conventional DOE fabrication techniques, uh, electron beam lithography, EBL, and uh, laser cutting. They can produce very uh, precise DOE structure but they are very time consuming, power consuming, and uh, money consuming. And uh, more, moreover, uh, normally they can only produce um, only low bit or even binary structure, which means uh, low diffraction efficiency. So the aim of this project is to uh, decrease the fabrication cost and time and try to improve the diffraction efficiency and accuracy of the OE. 
So instead of using uh, traditional solid state biophagen media, we will try to use uh, liquid crystal to fabricate DOE. So we will fabricate by uh, PBDOE uh, by air course photo alignment. So we have three keywords here, PB phase, air course, and uh, photo alignment. I will introduce them one by one. So what is PB phase? Its full name is pantherotam berry phase. So its general definition is the induced phase when the uh, system of the state, uh, state of the system undergoes uh, unitaries and uh, 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 cyclic evolution. And in optics, it is the induced phase subject to a continuous change in polarization between the initial and the final state. So uh, in summary, unlike traditional phase, which we call dynamic phase that depends on the a difference in the propagation path of the light. PB phase depends on the difference in polarizations. So by uh, manipulate the uh, local orientation of the optical axis uh, of a biovergent media, we can control the output polarization of the input light. Then we can induce PB phase. So if, if, if we have a, a biovergent media and its local orientation of the optical axis is zeta, it can induce two zeta or minus two zeta PB phase uh, for input being with left circular and the right circular polarization respectively. And uh, actually we can also get PB phase in liquid crystal. Uh, if we have a liquid crystal wave plate uh, with a distribution of local optical axis following alpha in the XY plane. So its drawn matrix can be represented by uh, this equation. And if we give this LC wave plate uh, a, a circularly polarized input, the output of the light can be described by this equation. So here we got two terms. The first term is halfway turn. I will introduce this later. And the second term is uh, PB turns. So the uh, two, two alpha here in PB turn is the PB phase induced by the uh, liquid crystal wave plate. And uh, okay, from this equation, we know that in order to get the maximum light efficiency, the first term must be zero which means that we must satisfy uh, this equation. So uh, in, in, PB, in, in PB phase, we call this halfway conditions. So this part of the light is the uh, unmodul un unmodulated light by liquid crystal. So in order to remove this part of the light during the uh, cell fabrication process, we must carefully choose the uh, liquid crystal bioregions and the uh, uh, cell thickness. Here are some simple simulation we did uh, on these hardware conditions by LCD masters. We can see here, if we uh, satisfy the hardware conditions, a zero to pi local orientation of the liquid crystal uh, optical axis will give us a strict linear zero to two pi PB phase. But if the uh, hardware condition is not satisfied, the PB phase induced will be very uncertain. Okay, so from previous slides, we know that we can, um, we can get arbitrary uh, PB phase by some certain liquid crystal implant orientation. But how can we get uh, the uh, liquid crystal implant orientation that we want? So we need to use uh, azobenzene photo alignment technology. So azobenzene is a kind of uh, uh, photosensitive organic material. It has two main properties. One is photo so upon some uh, certain wavelength illuminations, other molecule will change its states between cis and trans. Uh, but this, this property is not that relevant to this project. But, <clears throat> but, uh, but the, uh, if the illumination is a linearly polarized light, we will see the photo reorientation property of other benzene. So in one word, um, the other benzene dipole axis will, will be perpendicular to the uh, polarization direction of the input linearly polarized light. And uh, now, if there is a liquid crystal layer next to the other benzene layer, the liquid crystal molecule will align with the other benzene dipole axis. Hence, we can achieve uh, liquid crystal photo alignment. And uh, here is an example of the uh, uniform liquid crystal photo alignment, which is observed on the cross polarizer microscope. And uh, the, the other benzene we use is sensitive to uh, four fine nanometer lasers. And uh, we can see all liquid crystals are aligned in the direction perpendicular to the 
light polarizations. Then I would like to introduce L calls. So uh, the L calls we use is uh, digitally driven face only uh, liquid crystal on silicon device. We use it as the optical engine to generate pixel wise linearly polarized light uh, to achieve uh, pixel wise photo alignment. So it has a liquid crystal layer sandwiched by a top uh, <clears throat> ITO substrate and a button a pixelated electrical addressing layer. And its phase modulation can be described by this equation. And uh, the uh, pixelated electrical addressing layer is the key technology of this device. So by applying uh, pixel-wise voltage to, to the addressing layer, uh, the, the birefringence of the liquid crystal in that pixel will change. Then we can achieve pixel-wise modulation by L course. And uh, the driving scheme of, of, of our L course is uh, pulse width modulation, uh, P, PWM. So, uh, each pixel electrode will be applied with a RMS voltage to represent one gray level. And uh, each gray level is described by a zero one binary sequence. And then for example, uh, this is a driving signal for one gray level. <clears throat> and uh, such uh, RMS voltage across the liquid crystal cell will make liquid crystal, uh, will cause liquid crystal uh, uh, oscillate out of, out of plan. And, the, and, and then the, uh, the light intensity and the phase uh, modulated by this pixel will also oscillate. And because uh, different grid levels are, uh, are, are represented by different uh, RMS voltage, so the oscillation of different grid levels are different. So how can we use the property of L cores to achieve pixel-wise linearly polarized light? We, we just use uh, this optical setup. So we actually, we just need to arrange the optical components in this way. So both the input polarization here and the uh, fast axis of the cutaway plate as the output here should be 45 degree with respect to the uh, liquid crystal uh, orientation direction of air course. If so, the output light here can be described by this Jones matrix. <clears throat> So we can see uh, the output polarization is numerically half of the L cost for phase modulation to the Y axis. So we, we, we just need to design our hologram according to uh, this relationship and upload it on the L cost. Then we can, we can get the desired uh, polarization patterns we want. So, so far I have introduced all necessary technical background for this project. But before uh, we start the fabrication process, we need to optimize our L course fast. So here I adopt um, a deep, uh, a fully connected deep neural work for 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 for, for, reduce, for reducing the phase instability of L course. So after deep learning, I can get a strict linear two pi phase depths with eight bit uh, uh, phase modulation depths and uh, uh, with a minimum phase instabilities by our L course. Then is the fabrication process. <clears throat> the procedure is like this, uh, glass cleaning, uh, some ultrasonic uh, cleaning by Aston, IPA, uh, Deacon, and uh, DI water. Then is spin coating of our azobending material. Then is baking and the uh, cell assembly, L course photo element, liquid crystal filling, and uh, baking again and cooling down. And finally, we can get a small, uh, nice DOE like, like this. And uh, <clears throat> regarding the uh, photo alignment time cost, I did a, a simple ex experiment on it. We try to photo align the uh, a binary grating mask into cells that is already filled with liquid crystal by different laser powers. And uh, <clears throat> we found after a certain period, all these uh, laser powers can contribute to uh, good uh, PB gratings with equivalent uh, qualities. And uh, when we multiply time and the power, we found the energy required by each photo alignment is actually uh, approximately constant. And uh, we also found when the laser power is smaller than 0.1 milliwatt, there is no photo alignment effect at all. <clears throat> and uh, uh, here is a short video that can uh, verify this fast photo alignment process. Oops. 
I did, did not actually this uh, short video. So uh, here are simple structure. Uh, we a uh, simple structure DOE we fabricated by uh, uh, cost element. So this is a uh, 200 light pair per millimeter gratings. It can achieve 25% first order diffraction efficiency, uh, which is not bad. And this is a blade grating, uh, which is formed by 32 phase steps. And we can see the <coughs> beam steering effect here, uh, but, but the efficiency is not very good. <coughs> And uh, this is a Fresnel lens whose focal length is half meters. It can achieve uh, focus and defocus to right-hand CPL and the left-hand CPL respectively, which is in accordance to the um, uh, principle of PB phase. We can see, although the, <coughs> my, <coughs> the photo light microstructure is uh, quite precise, but the uh, efficiency is not so good. This is because the Halfway condition is not satisfied. We will try to improve this in future works. And uh, in addition to this simple structure, we can also photo -ally, we can also photo um, uh, complicated holograms onto uh, onto our samples. So in order to further accelerate the the fabrication process, we try to use uh, alternating projection algorithm uh, to calculate holograms. It only uh, takes thirty seconds to reach convergence for a 2K pixel size. And uh, here are some uh, complicated, int intricated holograms we, uh, we, we photo aligned on our sample. And uh, we can see, we can photo align the texture of holograms on our samples. And the diffraction of the DOE are quite good. They have good sharpness and uh, uh, diffraction efficiency, especially for this one. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a rainbow heart. We can see that we can achieve multi-grade level holographic projection. <clears throat> so that's the content for this project. To summarize it, we have now commanded, commanded the uh, whole uh, process of DOE fabrication by air cost photo alignment, including the cell fabrication process and the air cost photo alignment techniques. And uh, we can uh, reduce the photo alignment uh, fabrication time down to three minutes, but maintain a high accuracy. But we also have some problems. The first is a uh, low diffraction efficiency, which is due to the this satisfactory of how we condition. And the second is the speckle noise, which is due to the coherent property of lasers. So future work will mainly focus on these two points. So first, we will try to meet how we condition by using a precise blue spacer and by applying voltage to cell to, uh, to, to change the bioevidence of liquid crystal. Or more precisely, uh, we will try to use um, liquid crystal polymer and spin coated on substrate, which is supposed to give, give a precise thickness and the uniform thickness. And uh, finally, we will try some uh, 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 other hologram calculation algorithm to get better holograms. So uh, that's all for this presentation. Thank you. I'm in the interest of time, maybe we've got time for maybe one quick question if anyone got any, any issues they want to ask. Okay, that's all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next talk is from Sarah Almari and Ivan Greger on 3D printed wearable mesh for reconstruction gestures. First of all, this one. Okay. Um, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, just a side note here, um, this project is a side project that Ivan and I have always wanted to make about. 
And so it's different from our PhD topic. So we spent the last few months working on this um, aside from our PhDs. So today we'll be presenting this 3D printed, this project on 3D printed wearable mesh for reconstruction of hand gestures. Uh, throughout the presentation, we'll first talk about some background and motivation, what are um, wearable sensors and what are their applications. And then we'll talk about the material fabrication method that we've imp implemented in this project. It's mainly on uh, 3D printing. And then finally, Bon will present some results on the electromechanical tests that we've conducted on those 3D printed meshes. Some background, um, wearable sensors exist in the form of glove sensors, as you can see in the first top left image here, cameras that can detect hand gestures and uh, reconstruct them, as, in addition to EMG sensors, and you can see some of these in hospitals. Now, those sensors are used in a variety of applications. One is virtual reality and gaming, healthcare sector for surgery trainings, and then some applications on sign language. But the current sensors have some limitations, and those limitations include um, limited accuracy. As you can see on the glove here, we can we have strain gauges that are based only on the fingers, which means that we can only measure stretches on those places. High complexity, as you can see, it's very bulky, and then the a low comfort level. It's not very comfortable to wear while performing surgeries and, and other applications. Now. What we want to do is introduce a mesh club that is fully self-sensing. And by fully self-sensing, we mean that the whole material is actually self-sensing. So we do not really need to add any extra sensors or strain gauges on top. In addition to that, it's fully customizable. So this means that we can scan a hand, we can 3D print the whole process, the whole, the whole mesh, that, and it, it can be customized um, to each um, user differently. With this, we turn those limitations into competitive advantages. We increase accuracy. Now, instead of a continuous glove, we can actually track each and every node on this mesh because the whole material is self-sensing. We reduce complexity. We don't need to add external sensors. And then we increase the, co the comfort level because it's customizable and it's very flexible. Now, the question is, um, how can we achieve self-sensing capability? And this is through choosing a self uh, piezo-resistive material. And simply, a piezo-resistive material is a material that changes resistance when strain or stretch is applied. So this means that if we know the response of the base material, we can measure the resistance of that material at any point, and by that resistance, we know the strain applied. And in general, um, those kind of materials are characterized by the gauge factor, which means that the, um, it's basically the change in resistance over the initial resistance divided by the strain applied. So the higher the gauge factor, the higher the sensitivity of that material. For the material, we've chosen an electrical thermoplastic polyurethane, now, uh, or ETPU. This is a very flexible material, and it's conductive as well, so we can get this um, self-sensing capability. Now, the second question is, how can we fabricate complex geometries? And um, this is through 3D printing. So on this project, we have uh, utilized two 3D printing techniques. One is fused deposition modeling, or FDM, and we've used the FUSA I3M K3S. And we took a further step, and we fabricated the whole 3D mesh, which is this. And for this, we had to use a more advanced 3D printed technique, which is the SLA. So for this, we used the Formlabs 3D. Now, um, for our experimental methods, we uh, broke it down to two, three, uh, to three um, uh, sections. First, we printed some dog wound tests um, to get the electromechanical properties of the base material. So what we did is we tested, we applied any axial tension on the dog wound, but at the same time, we attached some copper sheets so we can connect them to a wire and measure the, the, the resistance as we stretch the sample. So we want to get both the stretches and resistance measurements. We then moved to a 2D mesh. We printed this 2D mesh that consists of a unit cell that's 16 by 16 millimeter. And then we've applied a pattern of six by eight unit cell to get an overall size of 96 by 128 and a thickness of 1.6. So this is fully in 2D. We then 3D printed it using the PUSA. Now for the 3D glove, um, we had to mesh a hand, a full hand, 
using a software called Anthropology. And then we use the uh, SLA form labs to 3D print. And this is the 3D printing process. And then that's the final part. Uh, now we will we'll continue with the results. And I'll pass this mesh around just so you can see. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'll walk you through the results. Um, so firstly, we wanted to establish the properties of the material. Um, as Sarah said, there's dog bone tests. So we've got the dog bone specimen um, and we applied a, that's the loading. So displacement loading, um, up, ramp it up and ramp it down. And if we look at stress strain plots and uh, resistance plots, um, we can see uh, this behavior. So resistance drops, as we stretch it. And now for different strain rates, we can see um, high sensitivity to strain rate as you expect from a viscoelastic material. And um, the resistance drops, as I said, as you stretch the material. Now, we believe that this drop in resistance is because these conductive particles get closer together uh, when the material stretches, that improves conductivity. And the initial gauge factor is about 30. Um, and then of course it has to drop, uh, you can't, drop resistance indefinitely. So the final gauge factor is one um, at that point. Um, this is a CT scan of a section of the dog bone. So what you can see here is layers, uh, layers uh, as it's 3D printed. And if we look closer and change the opacity on the CT reconstruction, uh, what you'll be able to see is these conductive particles. So um, this sample is full of, full of these hard particles. Um, inside, which um, looks like these are the carbon particles which conduct electricity in that sample. Um, now, we established the properties of the material. How do you go from material properties to actually measuring the mesh? Um, so this will be a bit of detail, um, a bit of technical detail, but it's kind of important. So um, imagine we have, imagine, let me try to move this. Okay, imagine you have this uh, mesh in 2D, and you feed, you feed it with current at this node 10 and the current is coming out at node zero. If you can measure voltages in, at all nodal points, um, this is what we do. We want to measure these voltages and then calculate resistances um, on the links. Um, so you, we can write down this matrix equation where um, this matrix ca captures the properties of these conductances or resistances. Uh, we have these cone vectors are the node, are the voltages at nodes, and the right hand side is the source terms. So you're feeding uh, you, the current is flowing out of node zero and into node ten. Um, now one set of measurements like this is not enough to calculate um, the the resistances of all the links. So we have to then feed the current into a different pair of nodes and measure that set of data. So in the end, we we end up measuring different sets of data for different pairs of points. And when you have enough of them, then we can calculate the resistances of our links. So first we tested this on a breadboard with known resistances, with known resistors. And um, the, this is kind of the ground truth data uh, that we have on the mesh. And we set up the model and then the model we can calculate or you could say learn uh, these resistances, um, train the model to capture these resistances very accurately. Uh, so the next step is to actually do this with um, the material itself. So we, we 3D printed this 2D mesh, as Sarah described, and this is electromechanical test with DIC. Uh, so the colors correspond to strain. There are wires, these wires are attached to a grid of points here. And when I play this, this is cyclic deformation. So you can see the mesh being stretched and the conductances of the links which are being calculated at every time step. Uh, so you can clearly see uh, the pattern. There are these five loading cycles. Um, so there is a lot of potential, but it's not as clean as we'd like it to be. There's a lot of noise. Uh, a lot of conductances are noisy, and that we attribute to poor connections between the measurement wires, the measuring wires, and the mesh itself. As a final step, we really wanted to have a 3D printed glove with some sensing capability. So what we did is we 3D printed uh, this glove using SLA. Now, there is currently there's no conductive and flexible resin 
um, commercially available for SLA. So what we did is we 3D printed this glove from flexible resin and then attached these links, which are 3D printed from our conductive resin. Uh, so we attach them to the, to the five fingers as labeled here, A, B, C, D, E. And then we did the test where we do a gripping gesture and measure voltages. And again, we can see clear uh, response uh, that we measure from the glove. So um, there is this, sales, this sensing uh, capability in this device. So again, five loading cycles and five traces for the five fingers. Um, so this brings us to the end of what we managed to do. Um, so we established the material properties. We tried some simple 2D measurements. And then we couldn't quite connect it fully to have a fully self-sensing glove 3D printed in one piece, but we did actually produce a 3D printed sensing uh, self, uh, glove which has sensing capability. So as future work, we really need to improve the connections between the, the wires and the material to accurately measure resistances. And then um, we would need some conductive flexible resin to 3D print uh, the glove in full. And once, once we can do that, then we can, of course, experiment with different cell unit cells and mesh thicknesses and see uh, what works best. Um, so thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Anybody online? Any questions? Hello. Um, did you do any um, work on determining the minimum number of nodes you need to actually do all the, capture all the gestures? So that that then sort of features into what your your final physical thing would look like. Yeah. So on the on on the mesh, if you of course to, to get the perfect set of data, you want to measure um, between every possible pair of nodes um, to get that. But that takes long takes a long time. So we need to to set up at least as many equations as to have as the the unknowns you want to calculate. So so like link resistances. Um, we didn't calculate this for the for the glove, but for the two D meshes. Uh, so if uh, if a mesh is six by six, there are one hundred and twenty node pairs. Um, you need about forty uh, to accurately calculate the link resistances. Okay. Um, so you can get away with fewer measurements as the full set, um, but you should. I mean, depends on what you want to do. Like if if you just want to know roughly what the gesture is, it's a different story as being able to accurate, accurately full, get a full 3D reconstruction of the glove for applications, for precise applications like robotics or remote okay. surgery. Um, and, then, and then another question, once you had the signals, although you showed the signals were quite complex in your mesh that you'd printed, did you try and put that into any artificial intelligence to try and find out if that made any sort of principal signals from your data? Mm, well, okay, so the 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 way the conductances are calculated there's a, there's one key step that i cannot gloss over because it's very detailed but how you go from measuring voltages to calculating resistances yeah right that is a that's one of the key steps um now the way we did it for convenience mostly is set up the model in pytorch like machine learning library okay and do auto differentiation to reduce it to to calculate the kind of optimum set of parameters fine um Okay, thank you. Yeah. If there are no further questions, can we thank the speakers again? Thank you very much. Thank you. And we now move on to a blue sky talk. So we have compact pathogen detector from Luigi Occupinti, Karen Kandukuri, and Johannes Pratis. And do we have a certificate? It was the, the original language for Gloomy. Oh, okay. so you just need a bag and pen. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Um, here we have the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Catherine. Oh, you didn't share from there. Yeah. Are you logged into Zoom? Oh, I have to log in from Zoom. I thought the connection was I can reconnect from here. Is this my other one? Is this one? Yeah. Yes. No, no, we still need it on Zoom though, because we've got people yeah. from Are both. Uh, yes, I'm on Zoom. Yeah. I can see. Just... Uh, yeah, if you share on Zoom, then we should see it on Zoom. Hoping to use some notes, so I thought I would be get connected here, but yeah, it's fine. I do have this on uh, mm. PowerPoint. Yeah, on his mistake. Uh, no, but uh, no problem. I can basically kind of like from here. I can. I don't need the notes. I can see that. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to find the link. Uh, Will you be the big event? This one? That's it. Okay. I'll do it fast. So I don't need to be connected here. Mm -hmm. Do I need to be connected to those? Mm -hmm. okay. oh. You want to see email? And I have to click the link. Mm -hmm. It's on the email. Uh, in your email, it is in the inbox. Yeah, this is the email. Right? So. And now we click down here and say, Mm -hmm. Recording in progress. You need to just mute my spot. Yeah. Uh, share the screen and uh, oh, the uh, Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, Sorry guys, sorry for the delay. Uh, today I'll be presenting uh, the, our project uh, for Cape Blue Sky 22. Okay. Yep. Hmm. That is on. Okay. Now I can see it here, but it's not. Uh, can someone help for me? I mean, I'm already here with that, but it's not allowing me to. So maybe I should come out of this. Okay, great. Uh, sorry about that, guys. So today I'll be presenting the compact pathogen detector, uh, which is our Cape Blue Sky uh, project from 22. And um, so basically, uh, the project we're talking about today here is a uh, compact, uh, which was aimed to develop, deploy, and validate a miniaturized uh, sensing device for pathogen detection in ambient air. And uh, this project focuses on integrating capacitive airborne pathogen biosensor into an existing platform for particulate matter sensing. Uh, pathogens are uh, transported by particulate matter of different sizes. And our goal is to try to capture the, uh, we already have the technology to capture these particulate matter. And our goal here is to try to detect uh, the pathogens that are traveling with these particulate matter and trying to figure out what kind of uh, uh, airborne pathogens are in these uh, uh, PM particles. So moving on. Yeah, so basically to introduce the uh, risks uh, due to air pollution, uh, uh, there are more than 800,000 deaths happening uh, per year just in Europe and uh, 
around 8.8 .8 million uh, throughout the entire world. And among these air pollutants, particulate matter are one of the main major hazards. And uh, these uh, have been known to be uh, carriers of uh, uh, many airborne diseases, uh, such as even COVID-19. And uh, uh, the starting technology to detect uh, these kind of uh, pathogens here was the first particulate matter sensor. This was developed in our group. Uh, by Pelumi, uh, who was also one of the uh, investigators of this project initially, he then moved on. But anyway, as uh, you can see here, uh, we have a particulate matter sensor, uh, which is a, a, a MEMS device uh, in the magnitude order of 1.3 times 1.3 millimeter. And uh, here, this particular PM sensor can be divided into three major uh, components here, uh, you would be, you can see the uh, heater, which is basically uh, using a technique uh, or employing a technique of thermophoresis to uh, size discriminate the particles from 2.5 to 10. And uh, then we have the PM sensors, which will be detecting these uh, uh, size varied particles. And then we have reference sensors to make sure we don't have any kind of noise or excess uh signals so to basically explain how this dis detection is happening we basically have a few pictures of uh uh fem analysis where we are trying to show uh the uh the heater uh, uh we're basically trying to show how these uh, uh injected airflow is uh, being separated which are carrying particulate matter of variable sizes through heating and uh, discriminating the particles into different sizes. If you can see in picture uh, three here, you can see that there is a, uh, yeah, there is a varying uh, particulate uh, matter flow. Uh, the red ones are PM10 and the blue ones are PM2.5. Uh, you should be able to see it that uh, it's kind of being covered over there. But uh, basically because of uh, the thermophoresis effect, whatever the air inlet, uh, like uh, through a controlled airflow as we send particulate matter of different sizes, uh, the heater then excites the particulate matters uh, to travel different distances, which are then captured by the uh, PM sensors that are placed in uh, at strategic distances. And uh, then, so to apply uh, this pathogen detection into the PM sensing, as I've already mentioned, uh, uh, particulate matters uh, uh, play a major role in carrying airborne diseases or uh, virus particles. And despite in the difference of size, the fine and fine, the fine particles act as carriers for the viruses in air. And uh, this is a general scale of uh, what kind of size variations we are looking at in terms of PM particles and uh, the red blood cell bacteria and uh, the viruses. So the application in pathogen detection. Uh, so basically the idea is to, uh, to the existing sensor, which is uh, currently able to uh, detect the PM 2.5 and PM 10 particles. Uh, we, uh, the idea is to functionalize uh, these electrodes with a hydrogel to be able to capture uh, a pathogen, uh, different kinds of pathogens and detect uh, basically their fingerprint and try to distinguish them from the clean particles. So before we dive into the experimental results, we first need to understand what kind of uh, uh, concentrations of pathogen are existing in air, just so that uh, we have a goal of, this is the kind of concentrations that I need to target to in order to have a valid uh, detection of pathogens, because if, uh, the detection limit is way lower than what you're detecting, it won't really be uh, useful. So here uh, we can see that uh, for, uh, for this particular experiment, uh, since we had to choose some pathogen, we went with influenza A virus. Uh, and uh, before I move on any further, I will mention that uh, we have uh, uh, gone through all the safety protocols and uh, we have acquired the, the influenza A strain of uh, H5N8, which is uh, completely harmless for human beings and have performed 
all the required uh, tasks to do uh, at this kind of testing in laboratory uh, settings. So yeah, uh, for influenza A, in order for a human to uh, have any kind of reaction or exposure, uh, a person should be subjected to a per day exposure of more or less 3.2 times 10 to the six particles. And uh, each uh, the weight of each particle is estimated to be somewhere around 0.8 femtograms. And uh, so from there, we can calculate the total value of influenza particles required for you to be consumed to have any sort of infection. And uh, since each uh, influenza A particle, like uh, influenza A virus infection particles are like 10 to the power of one to 10 to the power of pi, which is uh, uh, which would be present in these many copies. So from there, you can figure out what kind of concentration uh, would highly affect a human being if consumed either uh, through airborne uh, cough or uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, spray or anything in general uh, through an infected person. So moving on, so these are the kind of targeted concentrations that we have uh, that we are trying to detect. Uh, so starting with the biosensor development, in order to uh, start with uh, a proof of concept, we uh, first uh, made some interdigitated electrode devices uh, uh, by using photolithography on a glass substrate. And uh, we have uh, uh, developed a hydrogel to capture these pathogen analytes and maintain it alive in the active uh, detection area since uh, dry electrodes and uh, bio uh, biological substances don't really go together as soon as you have a, a pathogen or any kind of uh, bio element device, uh, sorry, uh, any kind of uh, biological uh, substance uh, being placed on a dry electrode, it immediately dries up or gets uh, uh, damaged. So in order to make sure we have a proper detection, we have come up with an idea of uh, developing a hydrogel, which included a polyethylene glycol dactylate uh, uh, mixed with a photo initiator and PBS. And after a lot of optimization, we came to a conclusion that 1.5 microliter uh, of uh, hydrogel solution need to be deposited on each electrode uh, to have a, a good signal uh, and good detection ratios. And uh, we cross-linked it under UV light uh, around the range of 300 to 400 nanometers for around three meters to uh, initiate uh, cross-linking within the hydrogel. And uh, uh, then influenza A antibodies are deposited on uh, these electrode hydrogel setup, which is uh, then uh, used to uh, measure different kind of concentrations here, starting from 0.5 microgram per ml to almost 50 microgram per ml, which uh, covers most of the range that I have shown in the previous slide. And uh, so the testing st setup initially uh, uh, to get a proper signal because of these interdigitated electrodes, especially on the glass substrate, uh, we had to build our own uh, connectors. Uh, we uh, I, I basically came up with a uh, uh, this testing setup, which uses a spring-loaded pins and a magnetic stand to place the uh, connectors uh, connected. As you can see here, the electrodes are placed here, and then a magnetic stand holds a breadboard, which is connected to uh, some spring-loaded connectors, and these connectors are in then turn connected to a. Uh, uh, screw terminal blocks, which are then connected to the potential stat. So in this way, we were uh, able to manage a very uh, a minimal amount of noise, uh, signal to noise ratio, and uh, uh, was able to get a reliable connection between the components. So after the uh, setup was done, the initial uh, question that arised was, so we want to collect impedance, but uh, what is the frequency at which we want to uh, take this? So there are two things that we need to consider before we can figure out what kind of value we are going to choose. We need to uh, basically weigh in between what kind of sensitivity we want and what kind of time it's going to take for you to finish your readings. So we have uh, done a frequency sweep between uh, uh, the frequencies of around 10 Hertz to around 100,000 Hertz. 
and uh, did a 3 dB cutoff uh, line to figure out what kind of uh, frequencies would be uh, you know, best to do these kind of measurements and then uh, chose to go with around a thousand hertz, which kind of uh, made a really good balance between the sensitivity and uh, the kind of uh, uh, time it takes to achieve these readings. So once we have these readings, we then moved on to uh, collect the impedance values. And uh, here you have a graph of uh, uh, average impedance values for uh, uh, this set of devices. So these uh, particular set of uh, values were obtained after using a 100 microgram per ml concentration of antibody. And here you can see a trend of decrease in impedance starting with the device with an antibody concentration of 100 microgram per ml. And as we move on to increase the amount of uh, uh, concentration of influenza A analyte, which here started with a 0.5 microgram per ml, then one microgram per ml, five, 10, and 50. We have seen a trend of decrease in the values of impedance. And if you move on here, uh, I've also uh, put on a linear regression curve for these values of uh, the drop in impedance versus the increase of concentration in analyte. And uh, here we can see a trend of uh, decreasing. And, uh, and, and again, uh, I would like to mention that this is for uh, the antibody concentration of 100 micrograms per ml. And uh, here we have a sensitivity plot curve for uh, uh, the data that I've just presented. So here we can see that uh, for a, a concentration of around 0.5 microgram per ml, we have a really high sensitivity for a uh, uh, antibody concentration of 100 microgram per ml. Uh, we have uh, this sensitivity gradually dropping. Uh, we kind of expect this because uh, as you increase the concentration of uh, uh, analyte and uh, the antibodies, we, you don't have enough antibodies to analyte concentration that they can bind together. So, uh, but uh, the main kind of focus is to concentrate between uh, low, sorry, yeah. I have one minute. Okay, uh, so I'm going to be speeding up a bit. Sorry about that. Yeah, so the next uh, graph here shows the similar set of readings for a lower concentration of antibody. Here it is 50 micrograms per ml. Here we can also see the same kind of trend, uh, uh, impedance values of drop, uh, impedance values drop as we go on along with a, a higher concentration of uh, uh, analyte. And uh, here we have plotted a linear regression curve for that kind of uh, Readings, so we see uh, a linear drop in uh, impedance values, and uh, then we have a sensitivity plot for 50 microgram per ml. Here, I would like to know, uh, mention one point that we will we won't be getting as much uh, sensitivity with uh, this concentration of antibody to the previous one because as you decrease the uh, antibody concentration, you don't have enough antibodies for analyte to. Uh, hang on to, so we might uh, see a little lower sensitivity, but this is uh, very still a very good uh, sensitivity. And then I have done a time scan uh, for uh, uh, the same kind of readings at a 50 microgram per ml uh, concentration of uh, antibody. And here you can see a trend of impedance values decreasing as we add more and more concentrated analyte, which kind of proves that uh, the, these devices are really good for detecting uh, the analyte. And uh, here I have uh, developed a front end uh, electronics to basically read out uh, the. So, this front end electronics helps us read out uh, the capacitor or impedance measurements that we need in order to differentiate these uh, uh, particles. And uh, so, basically, the technical challenges uh, that we have encountered are basically the lessons we have learned. Uh, while going through these experimental processes are firstly uh, trying to build a custom uh, setup that uh, is, that is compatible with the IDE and potential start was a bit hard. And uh, then I came up with uh, this setup and then uh, uh, that was able to help us reduce the noise in the electrical setup, which was very crucial for us to get this kind of readings. And the pathogen detection on dry electrodes, as I mentioned, was uh, really hard. And in order to overcome this, uh, we came up with a unique solution of using hydrogel and then activating the antibodies on the hydrogel. And uh, 
basically drying up of the hydrogel at low humidity is again another issue in order to remedy this we have to make sure that we have we are using this in a controlled environment where uh, the uh, humidity and temperature are maintained and uh, so the further steps uh, for uh, this uh, project would be basically to uh, put the biosensor together with the PM sensor and uh, uh, introduce a different kind of uh, interference from uh, air and to make sure there are, there's a baseline and we figure out what kind of changes happen with different kind of interference. And then trying to enable scalability by uh, developing standard manufacturing and device uh, calibration. So yeah, that's the end of it. Sorry for taking too long. Yeah. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. One quick question, if you have any. No. Oh, there's a question there. Um, okay. Can you see that? When the device is bedded somehow, how robust is the relation between the impedance and the concentration? Uh, to answer that question, but the uh, the devices we are currently using are glass substrates. If, uh, they're not really flexible. So at this point, uh, we did not do that kind of testing, uh, but uh, that could be something you can do in the future. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, guys. Now we will move on to the first of our new set of awards, which is the capsule awards, which are for MRES students um, from the Center for Doctoral Training in Combined electric and connected electronic and photonic systems. And our first um, presenter is Anthony Wojcik on broadband surfaces. And... Okay. Okay. We have a certificate for you. And Denise will be in contact with your plaque. Your plaque will arrive today, so we will give it to you at the bar with you, which I think. Very nice. Is that one? Yeah. I don't know if it's a good idea to just open it directly from the. It seems to be working so far. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so yes, so uh, I'm here to present my work uh, on the master's project in the CZ program that I'm in, uh, which was supervised by Professor Daping Chu. I worked on broadband metal surfaces, but also on other aspects of the project that I will explain uh, right now. So as the project evolved throughout the year, uh, one second, I'll just hide the Zoom, thank you. All right. So as the project evolved throughout the year, uh, first of all, I focused on an application of a simpler system, which is a uh, high number of aperture metal lens. And then I moved on to the title of the project that I worked on, which is the broadband med surfaces, which is an expansion of the first phase of the project. So moving on to the first aspect, I think it's the best approach is to explain the terms that I'll be using here. So numerical aperture first. Uh, the numerical aperture means basically it's a value that describes the acceptance angles for the system. So it means that it can vary from zero to one. When for one, it means that the lens that I will be working on here can accept all the light that falls onto it. And for zero, it means none light can enter it. And meta, meta comes from the word meta surface. And meta surfaces are very thin nanometer thin surfaces, uh, which are capable of wavefront manipulation. And they're made of typically sub wavelength, uh, sub -wavelength sized elements, which are laid out on a periodic lattice, uh, which in the end can be used to either modulate phase or amplitude wavefronts or change polarization of the incident light. And they spark huge interest in academia and industry research because they can be used in applications that are impossible to do with natural systems or components, such as, for instance, holography, 
or beam steering applications as shown here, or as I will explain in a second, uh, lenses, which um, for instance, don't have geometric aberrations. And finally, the lens that will be working uh, on in here is the perfect lens. And for that, we want to have a hyperbolic phase profile given by the equation over there. Lambda stands for the wavelength that we're using, and F is for focal length of the lens, R is for the distance from the center. And typically, the phase profile that we would get for our lens would be designed, would be achieved with um, basically shaping the thickness of the lens to achieve the phase delay in the material that the lens is made of. However, I will be using here a meta surface, which means that each of the elements of the meta surface will induce a phase. Uh, phase modulation at each point. So the question is, how do we design the meta surface or the meta lens in this case? We start with the phase profile. If we draw it on the plot, it looks in the following way. Then the next step is to discretize the surface. So I have a pixelated phase profile at the sub wavelength uh, pixelization size. Then at each point, we put the meta atom from now on, I will call it like this. It's uh, the sub wavelength sized element that modulates light. And hopefully, once we put all of these together, when we perform uh, Maxwell, uh, when we simulate the Maxwell equations of the light propagating through such systems, hopefully we get the result that matches the initial intended phase profile that we wanted to have. And for that, I used uh, uh, FTDT simulations in Lumerical. So putting everything together in one image, the most important step here will be to actually find the meta atom library, which is the set of these meta atoms that we will be able to put to achieve phase modulation. And one thing that is important to say here is because of this discretization that we use, that I chose to use here, it will put basically a limit on the size of the pixels that we can use when we use visible spectrum of light, which means that if we want to in the future design a, system, a lens that would work, for even the violet light, it would put the limit of 200 nanometers of size per pixel because of the Nyquist sampling theorem. So this will be the limit that we'll be working on. And this is the size of the pixel that it will choose. So moving on, what metatoms did I use and why? So I chose square-based titanium dioxide pillars on glass substrate, titanium dioxide, because it works very well uh, with visible spectrum of light. So it has high refractive index, which is good for modulation and high transmittance, basically no absorption at 550 nanometers that they designed it for. Oh yeah, one here to note here is that the, the lens that I'm talk, talking about here is only monochromatic. Uh, so it works only at 550 nanometers, but the section, second part of the project will expand it into uh, broadband modulation. And square pixels uh, or square, uh, base of for the pillars because it follows the anisotropy of the lattice that I already have here. So it doesn't expand on it. It doesn't make the lens more anisotropic than the lattice already uh, makes it. And also it can, by changing the cross section of the pillars, I can basically fill the whole space of a pixel. So given that pillar that I chose here, I can basically only choose two parameters, which is the cross section and the height. And hopefully, just by changing these two parameters, I will be able to achieve complete to five phase modulation. So I performed the FDTD simulations. And on the left, we can see the phase modulation diagrams. And on the right, the transmissivity of such pillars where the light is incident from the bottom and passes through the meta atoms. So as we can see here, the rainbow that we can see on the left shows that, yes, it is possible to achieve complete two pi phase modulation just by changing the cross section or the height. And on the right, we can see that at a lot of heights, we can achieve high transmittance at all cross sections of friction that we can choose here. So because of the fabrication constraints, in the end, when we want to fabricate the, pro, uh, the lens, it's best when we choose all the pillars that would have the same height because of lithography that we would use uh, um, to fabricate the lens. So I chose to work with the height of 450 nanometers for the pillars. So all of them will have the same height. And we can achieve the complete two pi phase modulation just by changing the cross section. So it means that in the lithographic methods that we use, we just need to print basically a two dimensional structure in the end. 
And one thing that I wanted to mention here is that while working the project, I came up with a very simple model where of a fixture uh, that tries to describe these two diagrams. And it explains the diagrams in a way that basically the light that comes and interferes with the system here, the wavelength is much larger than the pillars themselves, which means that in the end, the light will experience an effective refractive index. And this is because it will basically see a smeared weighted average of the refractive index of the pillars and the space in between them. And from that, we can calculate the phase, which matches the diagrams very well, and transmittance based on the fabric pearl model. So because the pillars, the smeared pillars would look like a dielectric slab between the glass and air above them. And uh, the results match very well with these. So given uh, the meta atom library that I generated there, um, I tested multiple lenses, but the one worth mentioning here is the largest one I tested. It has numerical aperture of 95%, uh, 30 microns in diameter and five microns in focal length. It can be larger, but I was limited by the computational resources that, were, that I was using. And it also works at green wavelength. And I simulated the phase profile of the whole system. It looks similar to the phase profiles that I've shown before. And to test how it actually performs, I trans uh, basically uh, took the electric fields and magnetic fields into the focal plane to see what the focus spot looks like. So one thing to note here is that it's not circular like we would expect for normal lenses. However, it can be explained pretty simple in a pretty simple way. So it comes all because of the choice of the lattice they choose. So I chose to work with square lattice. It means that when I use polarized light, it might have preferred directions of uh, basically polarization. So I used light that is aligned with one of the axes of the lattice. And it means that the focus spot will have two different full width half maximum at two different angles. However, if we used unpolarized light, this should be smeared and the effect should be more symmetric spot. Uh, however, even neglecting that, the diffraction limit is, or the uh, resolution that I would achieve with this lens is close to the diffraction limit. It's only 1.5. That's that. It's still sub wavelength in scale. And focusing efficiency is on par with other meta lenses, even though it's high number aperture, uh, which is reasonable. Uh, okay, so the question is could we expand this numerical aperture further? Uh, so, basically, to answer this question, I tackled the problem from a different side. So, I asked, what is a meta lens or what is a lens? Well, it's a beam deflector that deflects light at different positions from the center into the focal points. And to answer this question, I designed a set of beam deflectors working at different angles from zero to 90 degrees. I performed the same simulations as before. And here we can see the results. So on the, how do I show this here? All right. So here we can see on this axis, these are the designed angles of deflection. And these are the achieved simulation deflection angles. And we can see that we can have a very precise control over the angles of deflection, matching exactly the design values. And even with the efficiencies drawn here on the right, we can see that even at 90 degrees, we can achieve 30% deflection efficiency, which means that in theory, I could be able to expand the lens further because basically higher numerical pressure means higher deflection angles that we need at the edges. All right, so this finishes the first part of the problem. And then the second was to expanding this into Roland. So, so far, the metal lens only worked at a single wavelength. How do we expand it to work, for instance, for two wavelengths? This is what I tried to do. So I followed papers that did it for infrared spectrum. And the method or the simplest method that I found that I wanted to test for visible because no one has done it before was uh, with this particular arrangement. It was to basically use the same design that I used before, just two layers stacked on top of each other. So now I wanted to control both red and green wavelengths at the same time to achieve proper phase modulation. Uh, so the idea is that when we have constant heights for the, both of the pillars, we still have two degrees of freedom because now we can use, we can change both the cross sections of both pillars independently from each other, which means that maybe we can achieve control that's independent for both wavelengths. So I performed simulations for phase modulation, also for transmittance, but they're irrelevant. Transmittance stays high. 
So these are the phase modulation by changing both the diameter or cross section or diameters of both of the pillars at both wavelengths. And now to generate the meta atom library, we have to answer basically the inverse problem to this question that we have here. So we have to ask ourselves what diameters or what cross sections we should choose in order to have independent phase control on both wavelengths. So I wrote an algorithm that answers this question and here are the maps. So basically both of these plots can answer this question. So we can choose, I want to have a phase over red wavelength and phase over green wavelength independently. And what are the cross sections that I have to use for both of the wavelengths to, to achieve the phase modulation. And I tested this metatom library in a single arrangement only because it takes way longer to simulate these results on my personal computer that I had to use. Uh, so I tested a single beam deflector working at 43 degrees and uh, the deflection angle was perfectly matching with the design one again. However, efficiency drops to 20%, which is much lower than what we saw for the monochromatic beam deflector before. And it's mainly because the structure is no longer sub-wavelength in height, which means it might act like uh, diffraction grading a bit, which is, can be seen when we look into the far field. We see that there are diffraction orders other than the zeroth one, which is the planned one. However, it, would be, it should be possible to decrease the height of the structure further. And this concludes what I did in the master's project, because I only could work on it for throughout this year so far. And basically, the most important things I achieved is this theoretical model that I, that I developed, which works very well in this regime of metasurfaces. I demonstrated efficient beam steering up to 90 degrees, and I used it in the numerical, high number of culture metal lens. And I achieved independent phase control over two wavelengths at the same time. In the future, if I would be working on the project, I would probably try to expand this broadband phase control to, to metal lenses as well and move to the fabrication or possibly also tunability, which is useful in metal surfaces. So this concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? If not, can I just ask you how are you going to fabricate these structures? Oh yeah. Um, simulation. What yeah, this was all simulation. So fortunately, as I said, I was in the last step, especially I was following uh, already uh, an established paper that did fabrication as well. So the way it's done is both layers are fabricated separately using lithography and, for instance, electron beam direct writing. And then they are, the, the second layer is much thinner, has a much thinner substrate. It's removed and then put on top of the first layer on top of, uh, I think there's a, there's a liquid put on, the, on top of the first layer so that the second one can be nicely aligned with the first one. However, I don't know how it's done at a such small scale to make it precise because it's important to, so that both layers are exactly aligned on top of each other. Otherwise they might have effects that are unwanted. Sounds quite challenging. Too. Yes, but this was a simulation by <laughs> project. So everything works nicely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, yes. Our next capsule award is for Imogen Harrison and wavelength modulation near infrared spectroscopy for medical diagnostics. Yeah, but... yeah.
Uh, so, hi, my name is Imogen, and I'll be doing my presentation on my previous project, Wavelength Modulation Neural Phase Spectroscopy for Medical Diagnosis, as part of the Neo Lab at UCL. Okay. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the body requires a continuous supply of oxygenated blood into the body. So this is oxygen bound to the red blood cells um, or oxyhemoglobin, and then a continual removal of the deoxygenated blood out of the tissue of interest uh, in the form of deoxyhemoglobin. And if this was to ever be um, disturbed for any reason, it can cause serious issues, particularly if it was to happen to a newborn or a neonatal during a traumatic birth. And in 2016, who uh, determined that this was the leading cause of neuronal disabilities in newborns and the second leading cause of neonatal death. So how is this going to be overcome? Well, to first overcome something, you need to understand exactly what's happening. And this would require imaging the brain in a non-invasive, safe way uh, to be able to detect the oxygen saturation. But this can be achieved through near infrared spectroscopy, which is based off the uh, beer lambert law which essentially states that the concentration of the chromophores, so the oxygen deoxyhemoglobin within the um, sample, is the ratio of light intensity going into and out of the sample. And then there's a slight modification for uh, medical applications where the input light source and the detector are slightly uh, a few centimeters apart. Uh, and this is aptly named the modified bit lambert law. And as you can see, there's the addition of these two coupling factors. And these are unknown factors that are likely related to the geometries of the tissue and can change during recordings. And during uh, using the current methods, uh, these are just assumed to be consistent and are kind of ignored parameters. But this can cause issues, particularly uh, if a newborn moves and there's no real way to prevent them moving or for the presence of hair. So the goal of my project was to use wavelength modulation to try and remove these factors. So how does wavelength modulation work? Well, you take the modified bit Lambert law and then you integrate it with respect to wavelength. And assuming that these coupling factors are wavelength independent, these can be removed. And then the gradient of the absorption with respect to wavelength is uh, directly proportional to the presence of the chromophores. So practically speaking, this is done by taking the absorbers, again, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and taking two measurements uh, with different laser diodes at slightly different wavelengths. And then because they're close in wavelength, you can assume that section of the graph is linear and therefore find the gradient to that point. So the specifics of my project was to find the way to emit these laser diodes. So either emit both laser diodes continuously at different frequencies, or to alternate between them at a continual modulation frequency and a continual switching frequency. And then to find the best way to detect the signal once it's passed through the sample. So either using a lock-in amplifier or using Fourier transforms on an oscilloscope. Uh, so once this was set up, it was tested on by first these phantoms, which are just silicon block gels um, with known absorptions. So when you repeat it, you should theoretically get a consistent gradient, uh, and therefore it would be able to quantify a consistent chrome pore within a, a tissue sample. Uh, so this is a histogram plot of the different gradients that I was able to get uh, with scheme one. Scheme two, I was unable to get a signal that was high enough uh, to the uh, background noise to be able to be detected by either of the um, uh, either of the measuring systems. But as you can see here, the pink and the green were the ones that were using the lock-in amplifier, and those show a broad range of gradients that were obtained, therefore saying it wouldn't be able to consistently produce um, a gradient. So that, can, that wasn't suitable. But the uh, Fourier transform on the oscilloscope, the blue and the black line, were able to detect a consistent gradient. So that was moved forward to the next phantom, which is a bit more like the clinical setting would be. So it was again a larger silicon block, uh, and this time it had eight embedded um, uh, samples within it of different attenuations and different depths. And then to mimic the changing coupling, a layer of human hair was added on top. And then the probe was moved across one of the rows with four of the blocks to see what signal we could get. And this is what you would get if you use the current method just using the modified bit Lambert law. And as you can see, you can't make out the uh, four blocks embedded in that row. But when you use the wavelength modulation, you can much more clearly make out the four blocks within that row. And this is really promising. So it was moved on again to um, conduct the experiment, but this time over the entire block. 
Um, and this was the image you got if you use the uh, current method of just the modified bit Lambert law. And again, the um, rows of interest with the four blocks, row three and row eight. And you can again kind of not make out the uh, blocks of interest and it's just dominated by the uneven coupling factor. But when you use the uh, modified bit Lambert law, this was the image uh, that I got uh, with the into, uh, wavelength integration. And as you can see, it's no longer dominated by the uh, coupling factor, but it's also not dominated by the phantom use. There's something else, there's some instability in my system that is now being shown in that image. And this was again confirmed, um, and then just for reference, this is what it should look like. And then this was again confirmed uh, by this, which was taken the ratio of the two light intensities uh, on a different phantom at the beginning of each of the rows. And it should be a consistent flat line if the system was stable, um, as these measurements shouldn't change. And as you can see, there's no 50% uncertainty and change in the measurement. So there's some form of inherent instability in the system. So this was further investigated. And again, the yellow line is the line that you saw in the previous graph. And the uh, red and the uh, blue lines uh, were for the individual laser diodes. And these show instabilities in both the laser diodes, but mainly in the 674. Uh, nanometer uh, laser diode. Uh, and this could be due to three possible areas. So first, the Arduino used to emit uh, the voltage that was used to modulate the laser diode. That could be unstable. The amplifier circuit to increase the current so it passes the threshold for the laser diodes or the laser diodes themselves, which um, are temperature sensitive. So as the experiment is conducted, they shift in spectrum. And as you can see here, this was the recording taken of the spectrum at the beginning, middle and end. Um, and there is a shift. So it would likely be one or a combination of these three. And that would first uh, need to be uh, determined and um, fixed. And then after that, you could expand it to two pairs of laser diodes. Uh, and this would allow for a set of simultaneous equations. Um, which would allow for uh, the determination of the oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. And then assuming that the um, uh, coupling factors are completely wavelength independent, you would uh, be able to find the absolute oxygen saturation. Uh, so thank you. Any questions? Is any question for Imogen? Anybody online with a question? Thank you very much. Okay. I'll move to our final presentation from the Papsa Awards. So we have Captain Mama, Integrated Photonics for Automotive LiDAR. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Which one? the one that's name added. Name added. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Oops, Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. So, hi, my name is Kapadine, and today I'll be presenting you with my MRES project, which is Integrated Photonics for Automotive LiDAR. So, first of all, I think it's important to discuss what actually is automotive LiDAR and why is it so important. So, the world is currently undergoing a massive era of technological growth in the landscape of vehicles. And self-driving cars are no longer a thing of science fiction, but are becoming a more mainstream reality. Um, and the level of automation, which is available to us, is rapidly increasing. So if you look on the right here, you'll see that we're currently sitting at around levels one to two on automation on our roads. So this involves things such as parking sensors or cruise control. However, levels three, four, and five, which require very minimal or even no driver input whatsoever, are becoming much more mainstream. And we're beginning to see those start to appear on our streets. 
So if you think about a human driver who has an 180 degree field of view and they're constantly looking around, constantly assessing the situation, trying to detect any obstacles, avoid any collisions, it becomes very, very clear that we need to try and come up with some robust and resilient sensor systems which are able to emulate this for our self-driving cars to avoid, to avoid any collisions. So one solution which is postulated as being incredibly promising for this is light detection and ranging, which is also called LIDAR. So LIDAR uses the manipulation of optical electromagnetic waves in order to build up a 3D map of a surrounding area. So the simplest of this is called time of flight LIDAR, whereby simply a pulse is emitted from the system, reflected off of any potential targets, and then detected again by the LIDAR. Um, in this system, the time taken for the pulse to be reflected back um, can be used to extract the distance that has been traveled by the light. And then from that, we can work out the distance to the targets. However, for this project, I instead used frequency modulated continuous wave LIDAR. So you can see this in the top right hand here. Um, and this can be thought of as almost like an interferometer. So we're trying to work out one of the arms, which is of an unknown length. So we employ a tunable laser varying the wavelength, um, and that is split off into two different signals. So on the bottom half, you can see we have that interferometer of a known length. Um, and this is that part of the signal which has been siphoned off and sent to the balanced photodetectors. And this will be used as a local oscillator in coherent heterodyne detection. On the top, we have the other part of the signal which has been sent out to the surroundings. Um, and this is like that interferometer arm of an unknown length. So this will then be bounced off of any potential targets and return back to the system. If you look in the bottom right, you can see that at a particular snapshot in time, there'll be a difference in the frequency of the local oscillator and of that reflected signal. So this difference will be dependent upon both the chirp of the frequency modulation, um, but also upon the time taken that it's been for that signal to be emitted, reflected and detected again. So we can mix these two signals together. And then from this, we can extract a beat frequency, which can then be used to take out um, and calculate the distance traveled and thus the distance to any potential targets. So in the end, even though it's more complex, I chose to go with FMCW LiDAR because it's much more resilient to the surroundings. Um, the fact that we have to have a coherent signal means that we're much less susceptible to background count, um, but also incredibly importantly, this type of LiDAR can actually be used to measure the target velocity of any potential obstacles, which when we're thinking about automotive vehicles is incredibly important because lots of the potential collision hazards are also moving vehicles. Um, if you think about current LiDAR systems, which are in play, you might think about a rotating sensor on the top of a car. This is incredibly bulky and incredibly power intensive. So in this project, I wanted to investigate alternatives, which can be much more simply integrated onto a car um, and hopefully could then be much more widely adopted. So the potential solution which I investigated here um, was called an optical phase array. These comprise of arrays of adjacent coherent emitters um, and the resulting interference pattern of these can actually be manipulated in order to create a steerable beam. Um, so you can see that on the right hand here. These photonic, these OPAs can be integrated on things called photonic integrated circuits, also known as PICs. Um, and these combine thousands of optical components onto a single chip of only a few millimeters in size. This would allow for 2D beam steering, um, and it's also an incredibly fast evolving technology. So it has a lot of promise. Um, furthermore, these picks can actually be electro-optically controlled, um, which is incredibly fast and actually much faster than those revolving sensors which require um, mechanical moving parts. However, there are, of course, a few downsides to this. So in particular, the field of view is definitely not gonna be that of that 360 degree revolving sensor. Um, and even if we go back to thinking about a human with an 180 degree field of view, it will be incredibly difficult to emulate this. Of course, there are a few solutions. So we could be integrating multiple of these systems onto a car, um, but this is something which would have to be investigated further. Furthermore, we also have the arising of side lobes as a result of these interference patterns. Um, and so these side lobes are peak uh, peaks in the power um, which are away from that main central desired lobe. So this can introduce some discrepancies in the system and can really introduce some uncertainty, which is incredibly undesirable for the safety of the system. So if you think if we were to have two side lobes within the field of view, that means that any reflected signals could in fact be coming from any one of three directions. So it means that when we're trying to avoid any potential targets, it makes it much harder to actually know. 
Um, and this is something which I'll be developing later. So the first part of my project um, was looking at the literature and doing some preliminary calculations in order to actually ascertain what the key requirements for my system should be. The first thing that I had to decide was the wavelength to be used. Um, I went for a 15 to 15 nanometer emission wavelength. This was because um, the most commonly used wavelengths in LiDAR systems tend to be 1550 or 905. Um, and 1550 allows for up to 20 times more optical power output whilst remaining below eye-safe levels. Um, and also 1550 has three times less solar spectral irradiance than 905 at ground level. So we're gonna be having much less background counts. Ideally, I um, also then wanted to build this on an Indian phosphide platform because this would allow for the integration of all lots of components onto a single chip, which would be very desirable for simplicity. However, then when it actually came to doing my chip design, the only design kits available to me were those on a silicon-based platform. So I went for silicon insulator for my final design because of the incredibly high refractive index contrast that this has, um, which in turn means that you have much higher confinement and much less loss. For the horizontal field of view of my system, I wanted plus or minus 45 degrees and decided to implement this using phase tuning. So if you look here on the bottom left um, with the phase tuning, we can vary the phase between each adjacent emitter and then a result of that actually build up um, a steerable beam and really manipulate where that peak power is going to be. Um, for the vertical field of view, I initially wanted to go for a 30 degree field of view this is much less than the 90 degrees in the horizontal. So it was thought that just using a tunable laser in conjunction with a dispersive element, such as a Bragg filter grating, um, would really be sufficient to achieve this. Once the actual key requirements for the overall system had been ascertained, it is then necessary to actually look a bit more at the feasibility of creating this. And actually when it came to chip design, maybe the more intricacies of what was required. Um, so I did some Python simulations before doing my actual beginning my designs. Um, so you can see here um, that approximately 130 emitters really is sufficient to start getting those incredibly distinct peaks. Um, and you can really start to differentiate between those different angles within the field of view. In the end, for my final design, I went for 128 emitters. This was because I was using one by two splitters. So it just made a lot more sense to actually have two to the power of N output channels. I also wanted to really do a feasibility check to actually make sure that I could do this beam steering through the phase tuning. Um, and I think it's very clear here that this should be possible. Um, and actually by varying the phase difference between either all the way from minus five pi by eight between adjacent emitters up to five pi by eight, you're able to have an 80 degrees field of view. One of the main things that I really had to consider when doing my chip design was the antenna spacing. Um, because there was a massive trade-off between those side lobes, which I previously discussed, and also crosstalk. So this crosstalk could either be the coupling of evanescent fields between adjacent emitters, um, or it could simply be that because they're too, the emitters are too closely spaced, when you're trying to modulate the phase of one emitter, you end up actually modulating the phase of the adjacent emitters too. Um, so the close spacing would reduce side lobes. So you could see in the top right here, um, that when a spacing of a half wavelength or less is used, there's actually none of these extra peaks within the desired field of view. Um, however, this is incredibly close and would result in a lot of crosstalk. Um, in the end, I decided to implement a wavelength spacing because if you look in the bottom right hand here, um, having a wavelength spacing only results in incredibly minimal side lobes at the very far periphery of the field of view um, and should reduce that crosstalk. Um, so it was decided that this trade-off, this would be the best option to go for, for my preliminary designs, but then this was then investigated later on in my project. So once I had come up with my key requirements for the system, and then also for the actual splitter itself, um, I then did some designs using K layout with the NASDAQ Python package. Um, and this was my final design for a one by 128 splitter, um, resulting in 128 output channels all spaced a wavelength apart. Um, the next step of my project though, was to actually try and investigate how potentially this crosstalk could be reduced even further um, while suppressing those side lobes. So I began to look into apodization techniques which could be used to reduce the side lobes. So for example, using an aperiodic spacing between those adjacent emitters in order to produce a minimum distance between emitters of approximately two wavelengths. But at the same time, we're trying to put them together so that it actually would suppress all of those side lobes. 
Um, once this had been finalized, the next steps, which I would have liked to have done in my project, would really have been to actually finalize that chip design and then integrate that detector chip as well. Um, so this would all be done on one chip and easily integrated multiple systems onto a car. This could then be sent off to a foundry and the chip actually be fabricated, which could then be used to build an actual prototype to truly ascertain if this really would be suitable for self-driving cars. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? There's no question. Thank you very much. Interest of time, I think we can move on to our final presentation of this morning, which is a CAPA presentation from 2022 from Axel Tamboli, who I believe is online. Yep, great. So fabrication of oven-ized film bulk acoustic resonator for thermal stabilization. Over to you, Axel. We can't hear you. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, all right, I think that's some issue with thing. So, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to give a talk about uh, Avenai solid demanded resonators for potential biosensing. And I'm going to give a brief introduction about how one goes about using acoustic waves to kind of uh, have a potential biosensing. And the problems that we have tried to tackle in these kind of projects. All right, so acoustics for imaging is very well established in the medical field because the ultrasound imaging essentially depends on transmitting and receiving the acoustic waves through the muscle tissues and create an image. But the very core of acoustic sensing lies with the interaction of sound waves with the matter that you try to detect. And in case of biosensing, uh, the interaction of the acoustic waves with the biomolecules essentially is what you are trying to transduce in order to have an efficient sensing. Uh, so at the very core, we use an acoustic bulk wave resonator. Um, so the acoustic bulk wave resonator is, um, uh, is where, the principle of this is the inverse piezoelectric effect. So as we know, the piezoelectric effect essentially uh, defines uh, that when you apply uh, a mechanical stress onto the piezoelectric material, you have charges generated on these sides of the piezoelectric material. And that is because these piezoelectric material are not centrosymmetric. That is, they are not symmetric with regards to their center. Uh, but the inverse is also true, which essentially means that when you apply electrical charges or electrical signal to the piezoelectric material, they mechanically deform. Uh, and uh, we use the inverse piezoelectric effect to operate this bulk acoustic wave resonator. As you can see on the top left figure, you have uh, at the very core, um, the bulk acoustic wave resonator is nothing but a piezoelectric layer sandwiched uh, between two metallic electrodes, the top electrode and the bottom electrode. And when you apply a high frequency electrical signal, you have uh, the piezoelectric layer vibrate at higher frequencies. Um, and uh, F0, which is the fundamental frequency, occurs when half of the acoustic wavelength equals to the thickness of the piezoelectric film. As you can see in the equation towards your right, F0 is the fundamental frequency, uh, v is the acoustic velocity of the piezoelectric material, and uh, D is the thickness. Um, an example electrical response could be at the bottom. Of, uh, you can see an example electrical response at the bottom of your slide, where you have got uh, the log, uh, the log of impedance uh, towards the left of the graph, and you have got the phase towards the right, which essentially indicates that uh, your the bulk acoustic wave resonator continues to be capacitive until resonance occurs. If you see FR is resonance, and at resonance, the, the device goes on from being capacitive to inductive and inductive to capacitive. And that you can see from the phase because you track the phase using a network analyzer and you see the phase changes from minus 90, which indicates a capacitive circuit to plus 90, which is an inductive circuit. And then after the resonance, the device goes on from goes on to being capacitive again. Um, so how do you use the systems as biosensor? So you have got these resonators which vibrate at extremely high frequencies in several gigahertz, and you functionalize the top surface of these biosensors with antibodies uh, or even other biomarkers which you want to detect. 
And then when you have like uh, antigens from your blood attaching onto these antibodies, you have a mass attachment onto the surface of the resonator. And uh, when there is a mass attachment on resonating surface, you can imagine the frequency at which it uh, at which it vibrates is reduced, and that's due to damping. Uh, in the graph at the right hand side, you can see that. Uh, FR is the initial resonant frequency, and when the mass is attached on the top of the resonating surface, you have a drop in the frequency. And Sobre's equation states that the drift in the frequency is directly proportional to the mass attached, and uh, that essentially helps us to calculate the mass that has been attached, and then you know what effectively you have sensed in terms of the uh, functionalized surface. Um, so the other thing to note here is the resonant frequency F0 uh, is inversely proportional. The square of the resonant frequency F0 is inversely proportional to the change in mass, which essentially means that higher the resonant frequency, uh, lower the mass that you can detect. So it is essentially uh, very important to have lower mass detection so that you can detect even the smallest of masses. Uh, the, resonate, uh, the resonators that we have developing, uh, that we have been developing, operate at around one to three gigahertz which essentially states that we can measure masses as small as one femtogram, which is the mass of a single virus. Um, uh, cool. So the, the talk, um, the work that here I'll be discussing is about film bulk acoustic resonators. They have been quite popular recently because Apple just last month commercialized, uh, made a, a billion dollar deal with Broadcom to commercialize these uh, acoustic resonators. <laughs> And uh, they have multiple advantages. You use thin film because, as I said, um, you know, using thin films enable higher operating frequencies, and higher operating frequencies ensure that you have better sensitivity in terms of your sensor. But also, using thin films have other advantages, like you have better wave confinement, the standing wave confinement into the material. And when you use thin film, they are CMOS compatible. And given standard uh, MEMS materials like aluminum nitride, it is really cool to have uh, thin films uh, to, to realize these kind of acoustic resonators. Um, so um, the two main acoustic confinement structures in, in terms of F-bars are uh, film milk acoustic resonator that you see in figure A and solidly mounted resonator that you see in figure B. Why is an acoustic confinement necessary? Because you can imagine if you place a resonating surface on top of a substrate, all of your acoustic energy will radiate into the substrate and you wouldn't have any acoustic energy left. So what is essential here is you kind of isolate the transducer layer. The transducer layer essentially comprises of the piezoelectric layer with the top and bottom electrode. You need to isolate the transducer layer from the substrate. And in figure eight, you can see that you can etch an air cavity at the backside of your membrane. So you have uh, air. So there is no way that acoustic energy is gonna radiate or leak into the substrate. But uh, the other type of uh, confinement structure is a solidly mounted resonator that you see in figure B. So you have got, uh, uh, you have got multiple layers beneath the transducer layer made of high and low acoustic impedance material, each of lambda by four thicknesses. And uh, it essentially makes sure that all of your acoustic energy is reflected back into your transducer layer and none of it leaks to the substrate because the high acoustic and low acoustic impedance layers when, when placed alternatively, make sure your uh, acoustic components go back into your resonator structure. Cool. Um, so there are two figure of merit, which essentially uh, these two figure of merit define how well uh, your resonator performs. And that is essential because if you wanna use a resonator, you, for biosensing, you need to make sure that these figure of merits are met. So the, what are the two figures of merit? One is the Q factor, and another is an electromechanical elect, uh, coupling coefficient. So what essentially the Q factor uh, says, the Q factor gives us the magnitude of how well the acoustic energy is confined in the piezoelectric layer, and there are various loss mechanisms which uh, result in the reduction of Q uh, factor, like phonon-phonon -phonon interaction, thermoelastic damping, electron-electron um, interaction, and many are even unknown because there is still uh, ongoing research to kind of study that what what are the what are the various loss mechanisms which re which result in the reduction of the Q factor, and the other one of course is the electromechanical coupling coefficient. As I as I discussed. So you are converting your electrical energy that you supply to the piezoelectric layer to mechanical energy through vibrations. 
and you want to make sure that this energy conversion factor is as high as possible so that you avoid losses. And K-square essentially gives you the measure of how well the conversion takes place. Mm. Cool. So yeah, as I said, that these resonators can operate at a high frequency uh, of several gigahertz. You can detect small masses, uh, masses as small as single wires. Then what is the problem? The problem is that these resonators are not only sensitive to mass, but also they are sensitive to temperature. Now, what that means is if imagine you have a sensor made of a bulk acoustic wave resonator in a room where you don't have a stable temperature. And that essentially means your environmental temperature can cause the frequency shift as well. Now that results in false positives and false negatives because you can't really distinguish uh, you can't really distinguish that if the if the frequency shift is resulting from temperature in the surrounding or is it resulting from the bio molecule that that has been attached onto your resonator surface. And TCF, the temperature coefficient of frequency, essentially gives you the magnitude of the sensitivity of your frequency on the temperature, or the, de uh, the temperature dependence of the resonant frequency. So what we have proposed here, uh, we have proposed here an ideal avanized SMR. Um, uh, and what, what, what exactly it does is you have got a bottom electrode, but also you have got the heater embedded within the resonator structure. And we use the dual mode configuration in order to measure the temperature so that we don't need an external thermometer. So these were essentially the kind of novel things that were done in this uh, particular project. And one, we used the dual mode response that I'll discuss, uh, I'll dig a bit more deeper into that as we go further. We use the dual mode response to, uh, as a, uh, as a thermometer, the dual mode, uh, like essentially it involves using the intrinsic property of the material to, to measure the temperature. That has multiple advantages. One is because if you use an external thermometer, something like the thermistor, you need additional circuitry and that makes the system complex because you need more readout electronics and that complicates everything. Second, if you use something like a thermistor, imagine here we are using the microheater to increase, uh, to have elevated fixed temperatures, but a thermistor itself can act as a heat sink and whatever ener heat energy you are generating is lost into the heat sink. And you don't essentially want that because that is, you're fighting yourself to some extent. So we used uh, uh, a dual mode configuration. And as I said that the microheater is placed in the same layer as the bottom electrode. So it eases the fabrication uh, fabrication process. And, and also because it's in the same, it's closer to the bottom electrode. Um, it, uh, it is close to the sensing area and you have like a more uniform uh, temperature around the sensing area. So the first step of this project was to design and characterize the microheater. Um, so as you can see, there was a lot of optimization then using ComSol Multiphysics and other softwares in order to get uh, maximum heat out of it. And also we didn't want it too high temperatures because we uh, were planning to use this for biosensing and uh, higher temperatures essentially result in denaturing of proteins and we didn't want it that. So um, I kind of designed this using Compal Multiphysics in order to get temperatures in the range of up to 80 degrees Celsius because anything about 65 degrees Celsius denature the protein, but I didn't want it to go too high with temperature. So you can see um, the heater uh, tracks were circular so that it ensures a uniform, uh, uniform heating around the sensing region. Um, in the top left, you see the design of the entire microheater. In the right side, you see the fabricated, the optical microscopy image of the fabricated uh, microheater in the end. So the heater was characterized in order to determine that what temperatures it generates. So in the left side, you see that the heater was placed in on a temperature controlled hot chuck. And for a constant supply of voltage and increasing temperature, um, the resistance change was determined, and you see the resistance goes on increasing with an increasing temperature, and that essentially is the joule's heating effect. And what happens at a nanoscale is that because you have an increasing temperature, more of more elect more and more electrons scatter at the metal lattices, resulting in the change increase in the resulting in the increase in the resistance, and that's what you are seeing here. The increase in the resistance with the increase in temperature essentially. Uh, indicates that you have effective joule heating taking place and your heater is working properly. So the slope of this graph gives us the temperature coefficient of resistance and that you can use to kind of calculate that 
how much temperature your heater can generate for different powers. And that's what you're essentially seeing on the right side of your graph where you have got um, power supplied to the microheater on the X axis and you have got the rise in temperature on the uh, Y axis. And you can see that uh, a temperature of roughly 86 degrees Celsius was generated for a supplied power of 1200 milliwatts. Uh, so that was the first thing. We just wanna make sure that the heater is working properly. Uh, and to kind of determine that how many, how much of the temperature, the magnitude of the temperature that's being generated in the microheater for different power supplied. Uh, the second step was to kind of characterize and uh, fabricate the dual mode uh, SMR, solidly mounted resonator. So um, for achieving the dual mode, as I said, the Bragg reflector is made of uh, uh, a, a, a low and high acoustic impedance material, each of uh, each of lambda by four thicknesses, but in order to achieve uh, uh, a dual mode, we kind of thicken one of this uh, uh, silicon dioxide layer, which is a low acoustic impedance material, uh, but thickened one of the silicon dioxide layer so that we have two fundamental modes. And uh, you can see the red region, which has been highlighted in the schematic on the top left, where you've got mode one, which is due to the zinc oxide and the silicon dioxide bilayer, and mode two is due to the silicon dioxide, uh, zinc oxide layer alone. And why this was done is because silicon dioxide has a positive temperature coefficient of frequency, and that we know from theory because it has a positive temperature coefficient of Young's modulus, and zinc oxide has a negative temperature coefficient of Young's modulus. I'll shortly discuss why that is important here. Uh, but uh, in the top right, you see the, the, the COMSOL simulations. Those were done to kind of see the displacement profile in these two uh, modes of the same resonator. Um, so yeah, this mode, uh, this solidly mounted resonator supports two fundamental modes. Uh, and in the bottom right, uh, you see the scanning electron microscopy image uh, of the fabricated device, uh, fabricated device, the final fabricated device. And all these are cross sections, of course. Um, Cool. So when the frequency response of the fabricated uh, dual mode device is measured using a network analyzer, we got something like this. So we had mode one around 1.6 gigahertz and mode two around 2.3 gigahertz. Mode one, as I said, is due to the silicon dioxide zinc oxide bilayer, and mode two is due to zinc oxide layer alone. The Qs, uh, you, uh, the Qs are indicated. It's 87 and 62 the KD square of 2% and KD square of 1.5%. And because these fabrications were done in, in the clean room, arcade clean room, uh, the Qs weren't high enough because we use zinc oxide, which is not a very high Q material. But you know, when, when one wants to commercialize such a device, you would go for materials like aluminum nitride, aluminum scandium nitride, which can offer uh, higher Qs and higher KD squares with far more cleaner processes. Uh, which would leave a bit more room for uh, optimizing these devices for further uses. Uh, but yeah, so we have got these two modes. And the special thing about this device is mode one has a positive TCF from the theory, which I'll also kind of uh, in the next slide prove that um, it is also in the experiment. The so mode one has a, po a positive temperature coefficient of frequency and mode two has uh, a negative temperature coefficient of frequency. That means mode one increases has an increased resonant frequency with the increasing temperature, whereas opposite is exhibited in mode two. But both of these modes exhibit the same response to mass. That means when you place a mass on the resonator surface, both of these uh, modes will move towards the left. So what happens is when you measure uh, a mass, um, when, you, when you place a mass on the resonator surface, both these peaks move towards the uh, towards the lower end of the frequency spectrum. But when a temperature increases, uh, you have got uh, these two modes moving apart. So when we kind of measure the frequency drift, we are left with two simultaneous equations. And when you solve these two simultaneous equations, you get, you can determine mass and temperature separately, and you will be able to distinguish um, uh, you know, the mass response from the temperature response. So this kind of structure enables parallel sensing of mass and temperature. Cool. Um, in, order to, uh, in order to kind of uh, make sure that this is happening, uh, the fabricated devices were placed on a hot chuck. Um, the fabricated devices were placed on hot chuck and the frequency response was sort of, uh, uh, measured. The resonant frequency was tracked for both mode one and mode two. 
as you can see with an increasing temperature mode one goes on increasing and mode two um, goes on reducing for the same um, you have got mode one TCF as plus 62 uh, ppm per degree Celsius and TCF of mode two was minus 92 ppm per degree Celsius. So you can very clearly see that these two modes clearly have an opposite reaction to temperature. And uh, the last uh, slide that I would like to go is that uh, when we try to organize these devices, that means essentially use the juice heating microheater. Um, also, it is important to know that, okay, it is working well and uh, the heater is working as we desire it to work. And to confirm that these two modes are actually having an opposite reaction to temperature, uh, multiple DC, uh, sorry, various uh, ovenization powers were supplied to the microheater. And you can see um, with an increasing ovenization power, mode one again goes on increasing, mode two goes on reducing, which indicates an effective joule heating again. Uh, so this essentially shows that you can use this kind of an ovenized resonator to to tune the resonant frequency using the microheater and why that is useful is that when you kind of uh, supply a certain energy su 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 supply a certain power to the microheater you have a constant temperature achieved so the environmental temperature doesn't really matter in terms of sensor so this tuning of uh, resonant frequency using the urbanization power can be very useful to achieve constant temperatures and as you can see the tuning efficiency for mode one for uh, was around 7.6 ppm per milliwatts and mode two is minus 9.6 ppm per milliwatt. And uh, it just proves on that uh, this kind of thermoacoustic system can be very efficient for potential biosensing application. Um, all right, thanks so much for listening. Questions, please. I think as we're over time, I think we will leave the questions there and thank all our speakers again for this morning. And I'd like to invite you all to join us again at 1.30 for our CAPE lecture from Professor Hannah Joyce, semiconductor nanowires, harder, better, faster, stronger. So I look forward to seeing you all shortly.